Uh, welcome to our Wednesday night class of Live and Learn, where we are currently studying the Qisas al-Anbiya, the stories of the prophets. And as we are, subhanAllah, discuss, uh, going over the stories of the prophets, we are currently discussing Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, who subhanAllah is just such a fascinating uh, figure. He's just subhanAllah in, in the, the level of rank and station that Allah Azawajal gave Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, even at such a very young age. And this is where we found ourselves in our last discussion and going over Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, where Allah Azza wa Jal and, and, uh, and Surat al-Anbiya, uh, we, where we went off last week, inshallah, let me see if I can um, be able to pull this up. And where we left off last week when we were going over um, his story, subhanAllah, is that Allah Azza wa Jal from the 51st ayat, right, begins to talk about how he guided Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam from the time that he's young, right? That, uh, that Allah says, and indeed we granted Ibrahim sound judgment from early on, we, for we knew him well to be worthy of it. And then we went through the stories just really quickly. We went through the stories from the time that Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam is seven years old and he's watching his father build these idols. And as he watches his father build these idols, particularly he watches his father uh, build one that has very large ears. And when he asked his father about the one that has very large ears, uh, he says, you know, father, tell me about this one. Like, what is this? And he said, well, this is the, the best. This is the best of all the gods. This is the God of gods. And he said, well, what is it, you know, his ears? He said, because basically it, it's speaking to his power to be able to hear. But Ibrahim laughs. Right, he even laughs at his father, and it, because even this intellect, as a child, this intellectual judgment we talked about, is something that even the child recognizes that Subhan al Khalik, that I watched you uh, design those ears, I watched you chisel those ears out. It's not that he was was that way from the beginning. You, your own hand, actually uh designed this and chiseled it out so this idea that it can hear you uh you know he's laughing and subhanallah over time ibrahim alayhi salam is is literally threatening he's he tells us for the i'm gonna you know just like a child i'm when i remember being young and my father uh allah yurhamu, would uh smoked cigarettes and i had seen you know on i had learned in school that cigarettes cause cancer and you know for me that was it right like that was it so anytime i'd see my dad you know his cigarettes anywhere i'd i'd find them and like break them up right and throw dump them in the dump them in the trash or dump them in the toilet or like you know and i just say like this is this is horrible like you can't do this you can't i, I just want the best for you and i say that i mentioned this story is because it's the nature of the child the child doesn't care that you know about the money that is associated with it the child doesn't care right that uh, the fitra of the child it doesn't doesn't care about the consequences of other people when they are when their mind is saying that this is something that's going to harm you Right? And so it's not in their mind to try to figure out all these other uh, details around it. They just kind of go directly to the truth of it. The truth is it's harmful, right? And I know it and you know it. And subhanAllah. Uh, so when I hear Ibrahim, you know, laughing and saying, daddy, you know, th these have no benefit. You know, this is, this is not good. Of course, his father is more concerned about the wealth of it. He's more concerned about how much it costs. He's more concerned about what are the larger consequences. Uh, well, there's no larger consequences, of course, other than displeasing Allah Azza wa Jal. But he's thinking about that this is his livelihood. And also, as they answered, Right, like this was the this was the way of our forefathers. So they're more concerned about are we breaking a certain tie? 
And again, the smashing of these idols, this is where we left off last week. The smashing of these idols are more than just about uh, brick and mortar in terms of earth and water, right? Or it's it's really about the the larger idols that we worship, whether it's about uh, you know uh, for traditions of our forefathers that are that are rooted in shirk, or traditions of our forefathers that keep us more concerned about. Uh, dunya and more concerned about worldly matters than our Lord. There are things in our time and our day and age that people worship uh, the principalities of wealth and power, right? And so this is this is even the same case. Is like when do we smash in our own hearts the idols where we worship principalities of wealth and power? That which gives money, that which we believe as a result of that money, then you know has a certain power. Whether and that's even in as it relates to. Uh, you know, even a social political power, right? What will the people say? And as a result of what the people will say, what will my status be in, in the society? What kind of influence will I have or not have if I, if I uh, bring in a, a new idea, if I bring in an idea that even they themselves know to be true, right? Even if their fitrah calls them to that. And this is the case, uh, even in the case of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, where subhanAllah, he, there, his people are aware. They are aware, right? Um, that they, you know, that they are aware of uh, the fact that, you know, when he smashes these idols and they ask him, why, you know, who did it? And he's like, why don't you ask the big one, right? Why don't you ask the big one? And subhanAllah, when he does this, right? After he smashed into pieces and they come back and they said, well, we heard this young man called Ibrahim do it. Um, and so subhanAllah, when he asked, uh, he asked them, this is the verse I want to pull up, inshallah, Allahumma salli wa sallam habibina. In ayah 64. you know so in that moment where he's he you know says they can't speak he you know he said let's ask him and they say oh ibrahim you know they can't talk right you know they can't talk so in this moment they have logic they have logic i uh i want us to reflect on this for a moment because when we are currently studying certain philosophies uh, in the university, in academia, there is uh, the, the kind of belief, right? That people who are religious or who practice religion in our day and time uh, have given up a certain logic, right? There's this, there is almost an argument uh, toward because of all of the things that are happening in the world, uh, even because of like the way that we deal with law and money and power and systems and structure, that there is a belief or there is a thought out there. There's a philosophy that exists out in the academic world and it, that basically uh, that those who then practice religion have traded rationale or rational thought for the irrational. And that that by itself is somewhat uh, what spirituality or religiosity is made of, right? 
But in Islam, this is actually an idea we reject. This is actually a very clear line um, that kind of separates Islam from other, from other religious philosophy or from other religious thought. Because in reality, one of the things that we actually study in ilm and kalam, right, that one of the most basic things that you study in Islamic science is you study, is you study logic, right? You study rationale. Now, what we do understand is that rational logic is not the be all and end all of existence. We do understand that, right? We understand that, that the way that Islam gives a certain deference and there is a place for logic, right? Even inside of our own aqidah, there are certain things that we, um, that, that the intellectual judgment can arrive at, but we recognize that the intellect, the aql of the human being, the mind of the human being, even though it can have a uh, logic, it is still not the highest reality, but recognizing that it is not the highest reality does not erase the place of logic and rationale. And so for the Muslim, it's deen, religion, spirituality is not irrational. It is not a throwing out of rational thought, right? In order to accept something that is irrational. Actually, for the Muslim, it's, it's, that's not the case at all. And, and in Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, why he, uh, part of the reason why he plays such a huge role in the life of the Muslim, a huge role in saying that he is the father, right? Abikum Ibrahim, the, your father, uh, Ibrahim, is because he is really, his, his actions and his behavior and the lessons that he's giving us along the way right, are the things by which they're almost the keys to the other doors of the anbiya who come before him and the anbiya even who come after, because he literally lays down a lot of the foundation of theological thought, theological rationale, right, like in terms of critical, this, 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 this uh, key point in understanding uh, or understanding aqidah, understanding that theology from an Islamic standpoint uh, includes logic, right? Includes rationale. That it is even Imam Ghazali, the text of Imam Ghazali, when he gives us all of these books on aqidah, one of the biggest aspects of that is about proof. I, it's like, how can you prove the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal? It is not a case where we think Allah cannot be proven, right? No, the Muslim says Allah can be proven, right? And there, and there are Islamic sciences by which that is, is ongoing. And inshallah, bi'idhnillah, we'll talk a little bit a little bit uh, about that. But in this, Ibrahim Islam at the age of seven is saying, if you know they cannot hear, right? What, it, what is the significance of that? Of saying they cannot hear and that being, and that having impact in terms of, it cannot be the definition of an illa. It cannot be a definition of that which is worthy of worship. Because if the human being has the power to hear, right? And th there, are two, there, there are two aspects of this that are important in terms of aqidah. Number one, if the created being, the human being, right? And in this case here, if the created human being has a power that the almighty does not, the, the one that you're saying is worthy of worship doesn't have, then how can that be considered almighty? Therefore, in Islamic logic sakes, it cannot be an illa. It cannot be that which is worthy of worship. If you're worshiping something that does not have the ability to hear, right? And you know it doesn't have the ability to hear, nor does it have the ability to speak, which is also the ability to command. If it doesn't have the ability to speak, communicate, 
but you do, then what you're saying, right? Then the issue of the idol is that ultimately you have more power than the idol, meaning that the idol in and, it, uh, in and of itself then is not all powerful, does not have the ability uh, or should not be worshiped by definition of this proof. Then that's that's a uh, that's a going backwards, right? So this is if I back I, I take it from my standpoint, and then I say the one who I'm claiming, right, should be worshipped. The one that came before, if it doesn't have a power, then I if it doesn't have a power, then I that I have. This is important. Hear me out. If it doesn't have a power, then I that I have. How could it then give me a power that it itself does not have? saying this is not logical, it's not possible, it's outside the realm of possibility, right? So it can't give me the ability to hear or to speak and it itself does not have it. Therefore, it is not the originator. And so because it is not the originator by definition from an Islamic standpoint of that which is worthy of worship, because from an Islamic standpoint, that which is worthy of worship is all powerful, is pre-eternal, meaning it came before. In order to bring me into existence, it had to have come before. And so we're saying that which is worthy of worship, which is the creator, the one who brings it into existence, the originator, right? Then they have to have a power in order to enact that power, that it itself must possess that power. I hope then you, you're following me on that. And then if I'm saying, right, that I, that the, uh, that the human being then gave that power to someone else, which we know is, which we know is illogical impossible why if that were the case then hearing people could never give birth to deaf children and we know that's not the case we know that hearing people give birth to deaf children all the time we know that if that were the case we could have the power of kalam allah right which is the this is a, a and this is an important power to possess Instead of trying to find all kinds of scientific methods by which to cure hearing, we could just say kum faya kum. We could just say be here. And then that person would have the ability to hear, but we don't possess that power. We don't possess that power. So therefore anything that is created, or should I say invented from our hands, right? By definition, is deficient in power because we are deficient in power. So therefore, the one who is who is al khaliq the one who's worthy of worship, the one who is the creator, could never be deficient in power. And so, in these small arguments, right? This is what Ibrahim is saying. He's saying, "Wait a minute." There is a deficiency that exists in this illah, in this thing you're worshiping. There is a deficiency that exists. Now, what happens to the human being? When you shine a flashlight into a dark room, right? There's some light that, you know, you can start to see things for a moment. Now, it doesn't mean the entire room is lit up. It doesn't mean that. You could shine light into a dark room and only certain areas are given light, but there are still there is still some darkness that exists. So when he shines this flashlight into their intellect, right? Some light does go off. Something does occur. And they say, well, let me think about that. Right? Some light does occur. Right? They return back to themselves. Listen how Allah is saying that it was there in there. They return back to their fitrah. The dhikr of Allah, 
He's reminding them. He gives them a reminder, a dhikr and a fikr. He's causing them to reflect. They come back to themselves, right? And then they go back, right? Then Allah says, after that, they quickly went back and regressed. After logic came to them, they knew that it's like this moment where their, their kufr, we talked about this, is to cover. There's a portion of what dhikr and fikr returns them back to themselves, returns them back to their soul. And they look at each other. They look at each other, recognizing, did you see that truth? Did you recognize that truth? And then they undo it. They go back. They quickly regress back. No, 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 no. Uh -uh. Our, our ancestors did it. Uh, no. Our fathers did it. No, this is what we're doing. I want us to uh, recognize something that Allah Azza wa Jalla is, is telling us. Two things. The scary thing is that without a consistent reminder, without the knowledge of aqidah, full knowledge of aqidah, without taking classes on ilm and kanam, without taking classes on aqidah, that the mind could regress. Even when logic comes in, right? Logic comes, but it doesn't save them. Logic comes, but they need, it, it, it must be consistent. That remembrance, that fikr, it must be consistent. What Aqidah does is answer, ask a question, answer it. Ask a question, answer it. Ask a question, answer it. Why is Aqidah, the sciences, the Islamic sciences of Aqidah uh, create, made that way? So that when the psyche, right? Islam, and this is something that subhanAllah wa bihamdi, subhanAllah adim, may Allah forgive uh, some of our previous uh, aunties and uncles and, you know, parents who thought, you know, don't ask. I just accept, don't ask, just accept. When in reality, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he, he's teaching us, ask. Because the answer, right, are like breadcrumbs. It will bring you back to your Lord. You keep asking, eventually you will come back to Allah is, Allah is God. Right? You will say, mm, because that was deficient. So therefore, there had to be one that was all powerful, that had the ability to give it, right? To manifest that, who, and when the one who's current didn't have it, there had to be one to give it. And the fact that I don't have the power to give it to someone else says that I'm not the originator nor the owner of it. You have to have that in order to, to teach you who Allah is and who Allah is not. And who is not Allah, who is not an illah, who is not worthy of worship. That which is not worthy of worship. But knowledge must be something that's given on an ongoing basis. And if that knowledge does not penetrate the soul, if it doesn't penetrate the heart, it, it won't save you. Which is why we have tons of scientists. And Islam is a, we are, we are not a way of life. Islam is not a religion that's anti-science. There is much about science that confirms for us and affirms 
for us, certain knowledge. But we also recognize that science is only as relevant as its most recent discovery. We recognize that that science is the discovery of how Allah Azza wa Jal did something. It is not the originator of a thing. It is not the originator of a thing, not a single thing, but it is, it is the discovery of it. It is the investigation into it. So for us, Islam supports the investigation, recognizing there's certain that recognizing there is a difference between theory and conclude and that which is conclusive. Right? We recognize that. Science is important. It has its place. It allows us to arrive at certain things from our, uh, it, it is an intellectual judgments that we use, right? In order to arrive at the way and the methodology by which we will interact in our world but it is not the reason why. It is not the reason why. Hmm. I don't want to spend, I don't want to go, I want to, but we don't have that kind of time. And, you know, live and learn is not that, not that type of class where we, uh, spend too much time delving into the details, um, but it's it, it's fascinating um, how significant uh, these lessons are for us. That the that which kind of is that the beautiful uh, the the beautiful place that Islam sits because it's not again it's not. Of, of those who claim that all that all religion is irrational did not encounter Islam in, in its form, did not interact with the Islamic sciences. That those who say that Islam uh, is not based upon, that religion is not based upon proof, did not interact with Islam and Islamic sciences, truly. For those who say that uh, Islam is anti-science, they did not interact with Islam in its entirety as, as it is. Um, but yet, it's, Islam says these things exist. Okay? But it is not the be all end all of existence. They have its, it has its role, it has its place, but it is not the be all end all of existence. The intellect, the intellect is important. Allah constantly reminds us in the Quran uh, to, so that, you know, to think, to, did they not think that they, you know, fikr, fikr is a part of our deen. However, uh, the intellect without revelation can go astray. Whether it goes astray because it falls backwards onto a thing, or it goes astray because it went forward in the wrong direction. And so this is this is the case of what where Surat al Mustaqim to say how is that intellect being guided, right? It's kind of like Columbus, that he was on the track to discovery, but because his map was twenty five degrees off, he thought he was in India, and went on to name that thing. Right, and to name the people present Indians. He, just, he, he did land somewhere. And he did, you know, he did have a method by which he was traveling. But he was 25 degrees off and he landed in the wrong place and gave it the wrong name. And so this is like the intellect, right? The intellect without proper mapping, without proper furqan, can go astray and then label something that's not that's not its reality. And this is uh, we we have to be careful of this. Muhammad. Okay, I want to go back uh, really quickly, inshallah, to the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. 
I want to spend more time on that just makes me excited to say we should just teach a class just separate on Aqidah in and of itself. Uh, but in, inside of this, the people began to uh, slowly, slowly, of course, become very angry with Ibrahim. Right? They became more and more angry with Ibrahim and they tried to attack him that night. At that point, his father intervened and said, listen, listen, my son, uh, even though I, he had been threatening him individually, he had already been saying, if you don't stop it, Ibrahim, I'm going to stone you. I'm going to beat you. Right? I'm going to beat you in the head with a rock. Even this is how his father's talking to him. Like, if you don't stop it. Uh, but he does it. And, but this night, when the people want to put their hands, lay their hands to Ibrahim, his father's like, listen, my son is sick, right? My son is sick. He's, he's not well. Give me some time with him to get him well, because he's still very young. He's a young boy at this point. And so they, they you know, say, OK, so they allow him to take him and to put him to bed. And his father is talking to him. Like, listen, listen, you are causing a ruckus. And I'm trying to be patient with you, but you are, you know, just you are causing an uproar. And subhanAllah, as the people, as the father is trying to deal with Ibrahim, the people all are already uh, putting it to a vote. Like he has, you know, we have to, their, their feeling is like, we need to avenge our gods. He smashed our gods and we need to avenge our gods. Okay. Because they don't have the power to avenge themselves, obviously. So he's like, we need to avenge our gods uh, because they he smashed them to pieces. And I just have so many questions around that. I don't know if anybody else does. I'm like, is, if the power is in the idol itself, and it, then how could it be smashed? That if it is worthy of worship, then how could it be destroyed by another hand? And if it can be destroyed, then that's not all powerful. Then why would you worship it? If it can be, if your idol, if your God can be destroyed by a child, then clearly <laughs> it does not have a, a lot of ability. And if it is not the case, if that is not the case, uh, then, you know, then it, then it needs further investigation. But anyway, we digress. Uh, and so again, um, the people are making, have a council and they decide that they're going to burn, they're going to throw him into a fire. And so the father basically is eventually pushed like because Ibrahim doesn't stop. He then goes to the top of the mountain and he's calling out to the people and telling them, right? He is, uh, he goes and he sits in a cave. This is so beautiful because we have this consistently with our NBA where he goes to a cave and he sits. And as he's in the cave is that moment where he is exposed to the sky and he's asking Allah Azza wa Jal, like Allah teach me about you, right? Teach me about your, your, the essence of you, the truth of you, give me the haqiqa. And again, he comes to this intellectual judgment. He then comes to even more so, right? That it is that, that Allah Azza wa Jal, definitely he already knows is not in the it Allah Azza wa Jal is not on the earth nor is he in the heavens in this concept right from a physical anthropo anthropomorphic standpoint that Allah Azza wa Jal is greater than anything that is anthropomorphic and I say that a thousand times that Allah Azza wa Jal is greater than anything that is anthropomorphic uh, in its nature and that which is matter right that which is matter is a created thing, exists in, ter in terms of uh, time and space. And Allah Azza wa Jal is greater than that. Allahu Akbar. So then subhanAllah, uh, as he continues with the people, the people are like, that's it. We've given him a chance for his father to set him aright. We've given him a chance for his father to correct him. They begin to uh, build a fire. And they, over days of time, they just continue to keep throwing uh, things into the fire, uh, making the fire grow, grow and so, until it became like this huge uh, bonfire, until it was like to the heavens. And it was, there was a way by which they uh, concealed it, right? So that it would continue to burn without burning down uh, they, basically their neighborhood, their area. And so subhanAllah, the day comes and they say, okay, because the, the fire is so large and so hot, the heat is so heavy, um, they, they have a method by which they catapult someone into this fire. They don't go up to it. They actually catapult the person into the fire. So the day had come when Prophet Ibrahim, and he's young, 
right? He's young. He's still considered a child at this point. Uh, and I, I want us to know that that he, when it's when he's catapulted, right? The day comes and he's placed on the catapult and they catapult him as he's midair. Midair, an angel is sent to Ibrahim. And Alekabihaj, like, is there anything that you need? Hey, like, and Ibrahim alayhi salam says, not from you. Not from you. Look at his level of yaqeen. Look at his level of like anything from the khalq at this point, anything from creation can't help me. I need Allah. This is what, mashallah, the 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 hadith, the hadith on Ibrahim alayhi salam as he's in the air, angel comes to him. So anything I can do for you is enough for me. That if anyone is going to save me, it's going to be Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? And subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah and azim, that Allah uh, then says, right, we'll go, we'll go to the ayat. Qalu harriquhu wa ansuru alihatakum in That um, Subhanallah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, in Matana tells us that Subhanallah they plotted, right? They plotted to burn him, and they threw him in the fire. And Allah told the fire, right, to be barden was salama, to be cool and safe. There is there's so. Uh, many lessons that are inside of this and based upon the time I already know that subhanallah uh, the prophet Ibrahim story will be three parts and next week I'll try to be factor inshallah be in that and so uh, in this story of Ibrahim alayhi salam where Allah orders the fire to be cool and to be safe what's so beautiful about this is that the first thing is is that it's it's barda right which is to it's to be cool but something can be cool and still be harmful like you could still be burned by steam you could still you know there could be uh it, it, it could be there could be smoke damage there could be you know smoke inhalation there are a number of things that can still happen and so Allah saying to be cool and safe right and and there are two aspects to this one on the physical level right so that it's it's that it uh, what it does is that it it takes the it takes away uh that which we which we would look at that we would normally from a customary judgment and this is where we're gonna i i, I want you to see my transgression here i mean my mela save me from transgression progression here astaghfirullah from intellectual and customary to a sharia judgment okay so intellectually right we will say customarily when fire is hot customarily we know fire to be hot and that it has the potential to burn right that's what we know customarily now what allah azawaja is taking us to to a sharia judgment telling us that the science matter, that that what you see is not the only reality of a thing. That Allah ultimately is in control of a thing. So in this, in the Sharia matter, Allah is teaching us who is in control, that the originator has the power over it. So we know fire, to be hot and to burn. Allah says, yes. And I teach you that, right? I give you that customarily so that you know to use fire to warm yourself. You know to use fire to, to burn, to purify, 
right? To remove disease or, or germs from something. You also know fire for the sake of being able to mold and shape. It doesn't only destroy, it has the ability to, to mold and shape certain weapons or cut the, you know, cutlery or things like that. It can, it can uh, mold steel and iron, but also you use it to cook. There are many things that the, that what fire does, we use it for. However, recognize that Allah Azza wa Jal is the creator of the fire of it in and of itself. What is Allah teaching us? What is Allah teaching us? Don't be so focused on the creation that you lose hope or you lose sight of the creator, that you lose sight of who is in control of it. I'm telling you, in our time in COVID, this is a huge lesson for us. And so many debates that are going on in, in, our, in our life right now, that subhanAllah, that what could be and is, is absolutely a trial for many, could Allah has the ability to remove its harm because he is the creator of it. He doesn't want us to be so focused like this, khauf, so afraid, right? So afraid that we forget to do this. Ya Allah, you're the one in control. You're the one in control. You are the, 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 the anecdote is with you. The cure is with you. The solution is with you. It is your creation as I am your creation. We're both from the khalq. We're both under your commandment. Right? It's not the be all end all of existence. And so in this moment, in this moment of mu'jizah, in this moment of miracle, there comes another two many, but uh, I'll try to just give two of them, two aspects. Well, the one we've already given. In the concept, in the Islamic concept of fire burns, this is an, an aqidah argument, right? Fire burns. The naturalist says, there is a natural element in fire that causes it to burn. Hear me. The naturalist says there is a natural element in fire that causes it to burn. If we're not careful, we might not see the problem in its argument. We are giving causation to the natural element saying that the natural element has power to create something burning in this case. We say, no, right? This gives power to nature as if nature creates. The rationalist says there is an interdependency between fire and burning. And when these two, when fire is, when fire happens, fire must burn, right? There is an interdependency in this relationship. Fire occurs, burning occurs, which says these two together can create burning. Also for the Muslim, said, no. There is giving causation to the relationship, right? There's a relationship between fire and burning and interdependency. The Muslim says no. Those who choose intellect over revelation, hear what I'm saying. We're not saying that there is minus intellect. Absolutely not. That's, that's the case in the story of Prophet Ibrahim. That's how we're arriving at this understanding. 
but those who choose intellect over revelation say Allah created fire to burn. Therefore, fire must burn. Allah created fire to burn, it must burn. Hmm. The problem is the people of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, the, the believer, the judgment of the believer says Allah creates fire and Allah creates burning. And if, if Allah commands fire to burn, it will burn. But if Allah does not command fire to burn, it will not burn. If Allah commands fire to be harmful, it will be harmful. But if Allah commands fire to be helpful, it will be helpful. That the causative agent is Allah Azza wa Jal, and the determine the determining factor of the effect is Allah Azza wa Jal. The believer says, "La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah." There is no power and no might except that from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, that if Allah removes the customary judgment, if Allah suspends what customarily happens, as would be his choice, and he's done many times, and you don't have to be religious to know that, that if Allah suspends it, what customarily happens, we say, well, that was a natural, sometimes people say that was a natural phenomenon. All right, wow, that was, that was an exception. That was an exception to the rule. That, that doesn't normally happen, right? And it doesn't normally go that way. Something exceptionally extraordinary happened. The Muslim says that's a miracle from Allah. Allah does as he chooses, when he chooses, how he chooses. Allah does when he chooses how he chooses, the way he chooses. If Allah commands the fire, you can strike a match. You strike a match. How many times you, you, you know, you're striking the match and you're doing the same exact action. No interdependency. It's not until Allah commands kum. Does fire occur? Because fire is an act of khalaq. It is under the, it is an act of, it is creation. It is under the command of its creator. Right? It's under the command of its creator. Five people standing, you know, uh, the example, does a bullet kill? A bullet cannot create death. 50 cent can get fit, can get shot, I don't know what, seven times, 50 times in the face. He doesn't die. Gets lodged here, lodged there. 50 times in the face, seven times, I don't know. 50 cent gets shot in the face multiple times. Does he die? No. Why? Because bullets don't kill. They don't command death. Allah commands death. Doesn't happen until Allah chooses when he chooses, how he chooses. Another person gets shot, it grazes them. They die. They die from the sound of the bullet, the bullet shot. They die. They die. Why? Because death was commanded for them. In this moment, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also saying to the believer is yes, your intellect is important. Right? Your intellectual judgment will cause you to arrive at a certain thing. It will cause you basically to be able to reflect on the customary laws by which I have created by which I have created the universe. But who is the governor of the customary laws? It's Allah Azza that the human being does not command it. Now, what happens in the case of Ibrahim? He doesn't burn. He doesn't burn. He, he comes out of that fire. He walks out of it unharmed. What do the people do? They recognize, whoa, what just happened here? He walks out of the fire safe, and then Allah Azza wa Jalla commands him to leave and to take his nephew Lut with him. Go, you, Sarah, Lut, your wife, go. Later on, go. You guys go, 
<laughs> These people won't listen after years of talking to them, years, years, years talking to them, years, time to talk to them, time to go. He orders them to migrate and to leave these people. Now, there are so many lessons again inside of this about teaching us who our Lord is, teaching us about the power of Allah, teaching us about the limited power of the human being, teaching us about intellectual judgment, but also teaching us about submission to Sharia and not choosing our created intellect, which is intellect also being a portion of the khalq, a portion of the creation, to not choose the creation of rationale over revelation that which comes from its creator its originator and to not deny miracles that Allah is also teaching us about different levels and different types of disbelief that one aspect is just an open one you're worshiping things from brick and mortar another one is you are worshiping from the perspective right, of ancestral tradition. You are choosing culture and, line and ancestral lineage over revelation. The next type is those who are choosing intellect over revelation. And Allah says each of them have their place. There is, we have a certain deference to our parents, a certain respect for our elders that has its place, but not over Allah. We respect our lineage, something Allah came, Allah sent the Prophet and sent him an Islamic law to preserve. We respect it, but we don't choose it over Allah. We respect the intellect. We don't choose it over Allah. We respect the customary laws, but we know the one who created it and the originator of it has the ability to suspend it. We don't choose it over Allah. Look at the different levels, right? The different levels are uh, earthly, ancestral, right? Somewhat earthly. Uh, another one is like from a from a uh, like the the worship of um um this plane right then the other one is self worship i worship what i can see and understand i worship the way i if it's not if if it's not the way i understand it to be if i can't intellectualize it it didn't exist this is another type of worship these are all uh either outright kufr or shirk. And Allah is undoing each one of these in this story of Prophet Ibrahim salam. That is the, and then forgive me. Uh, so inshallah, we will just uh, stop here and we'll read the three kuls uh, and then we will quickly go to Surah Al Maghrib. Jazakum la ad khayat for today's class. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to join together again next week for Ibrahim's life as an adult. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qulhu Allahu ahad. Allahu sumad. Lam yalid wa lam yunad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qulhu Allahu ahad. Allahu sumad. Lam yalid wa lam yunad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qulhu Allahu ahad. Allahu sumad. Lam yalid wa lam yunad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
قل أعوذ برب الفلق من شر ما خلق ومن شر الغاسقين إذا وقب ومن شر النفاثات في الأقد ومن شر حاسدين إذا حسن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الفلق من شر ما خلق ومن شر غاسقين إذا هقب ومن شر النفاثات في الأقد ومن شر حاسدين إذا حسن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الفلق من شر ما خلق ومن شر غاسقين إذا هقب ومن شر النفاثات في الأقد ومن شر حاسدين إذا حسن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الناس مالك الناس إله الناس من شر الوسواس الخناس الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الناس مالك الناس إله الناس من شر الوسواس الخناس الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الناس مالك الناس إله الناس من شر الوسواس الخناس الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل بسم الله الذي لا يضر مع اسمه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء وهو سميع عليم بسم الله الذي لا يضر مع اسمه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء وهو سميع عليم بسم الله الذي لا يضر مع اسمه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء وهو سميع عليم بسم الله الذي لا يضر مع اسمه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء وهو سميع عليم اللهم صل على حبيبنا منى محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم ان شاء الله i'm putting uh, all of my i'm going to send to everyone if you have questions that you'd like to ask about tonight's class uh, i'm putting my email in the chat uh, please send me the questions inshallah we will uh, start next week's class with them again i get where uh, we'll be covering prophet ibrahim alayhi salam for a third time uh, inshallah, bi um, because again, he's so he's so expansive, so important inside of our uh, deen that it's something we say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadan wa ala alihi kama salaita ala Sayyidina Ibrahim ala ali Sayyidina Ibrahim inna ka hamidu majid. And so with that, it's just it, it, we can't cover Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam in thirty minutes or forty minutes. Uh, his life is just too important. His message, his yeah, this this risala for us is just too monumental uh, to cover in such a short time. So jazakum la al khair for your jazakum la al khair for your you joining us for this class. Inshallah, see you next week again. If you have any questions, please, please, please send me your questions to ip34 at nyu.edu. Happy Maghrib. Assalamu alaikum.